All right, welcome to the uh, uh, Starling X project onboarding session. Um, my name is Greg Wayne's Wind River. I'm uh, Brent Rousel from the Starling X TSC. I'm Bruce Jones from Intel. And we're going to just kind of tag team on uh, going through this uh, onboarding presentation with you. Um, I'll start off uh, just with some high level project overview. Um, so yeah, so Starling X, we're a, we're a new OpenStack pilot project uh, under the OpenStack Foundation, running Apache 2 license. We're basically six months old. We got uh, announced uh, back in the Vancouver summit. And uh, we were formed with seed code from Wind River's uh, Titanium Cloud uh, product portfolio. And at a, at a high level, Starling X is basically deployment ready, fully integrated, full stack, open stack solution. Uh, we've got a lot of features that enable it to, for edge deployments. Uh, we focus a lot on high availability, high performance scalability, and ease of use uh, in, uh, in providing that, that fully integrated solution. Um, our first, uh, first community release actually occurred on October 24th. So uh, we've got our first release out after, uh, after six months. Um, and then just wanted to point everybody, there is a Starling X, uh, IO, uh, .io uh, website. It's a, a good website, it's got pointers, so obviously the code in, in the Git, and, and, then, uh, and then documentation for both new contributors uh, as well as uh, end users, just uh, you know, for, for example, installation guides for, for various uh, deployment configs. And as always, and well, what this is about is all about in, you know, encouraging uh, um, more people to join the Starling X community and contribute. Um, so yeah, so first just a couple of context slides around edge computing. So I think everybody knows about, uh, um, you know, edge computing is about, uh, you know, moving the typ <laughs> typically centrally deployed cloud uh, closer to the edge. And what's driving that is, uh, there's a number of drivers, but the absolute number one is around latency. Um, there's a number of kind of new genre of applications that are running applications that, that need to be, you know, real time uh, sensitive. So, uh, and, and they're running on devices that just don't have enough uh, uh, computing themselves. So they need, they need the, the cloud services, the cloud compute services, the cloud storage services, cloud networking services. They need it and they need it uh, like with low latency to provide kind of real real-time services. Um, but there's also, there's also drivers like, you know, reducing the bandwidth. You don't want to be backhauling all, like a lot of these new apps are, are you know, driving lots of, uh, of uh, bandwidth back to the cloud. So you don't want that crossing your network. And for security reasons, you don't even want that crossing all your network. So a number of drivers, but certainly number one is, uh, is latency. Um, some of the edge computing challenges that, that uh, uh, get presented to any solution that's trying to design for the edge and in areas that we, we've looked in in Starling X is, uh, yeah, zero touch provisioning is one area. Certainly, you know, uh, doing an install of a cloud uh, is, is not a do it once and forget when you've got like a hundred or a thousand edge clouds. You might be installing one every month or something like that. So certainly reducing the effort in uh, doing installs is an important uh, air challenge. Uh, central management, so certainly uh, managing the hundred or thousand edge clouds is, uh, is a challenge and, you know, doing, you know, just doing things like uh, managing software patches across, software patches for the platform cloud infrastructure across that many edge clouds is something that you want to be, you know, not difficult to do and easy to manage centrally. Um, Single pane of glass is, yeah, certainly all these centralized functions, um, you know, like even, you know, aggregating fault data and telemetry data across these edge clouds is something that you want to do without having to log in individually to each of these uh, edge sites. Um, so you want the single pane of glass for, for doing a lot of these orchestrated functions across the edge clouds. Scaling large and small is also a challenge. Uh, large is, is usually easier because, you know, we're coming from a data center type uh, environment, 
but and it's actually small that becomes the harder one being able to you know uh, shrink down your uh, edge edge cloud solution onto like a single server and that sort of thing uh, edge cloud availability and autonomy so these edge clouds are out in the middle of nowhere so they have to be highly available you can't be sending you know uh, somebody out to the site if something fails so they have to be highly available autonomy again they're they're out in the middle of nowhere you know connectivity isn't that great in some of these to, to some of these edge sites so so the edge cloud being able to be autonomous when it loses connectivity to the cent in any central uh, site is important as well and then again security it's out in the middle of nowhere it's not in a locked data center so there's different security challenges with uh, with edge sites so these are just some of the kind of key challenges that, that we've looked at with Starling X. Um, some of the use cases with Starling X, so, so certain, a lot, of, a lot of the edge computing, I think, kind of, kind of began in the kind of telco uh, 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 market, uh, certainly with all the, you know, we've seen some 5G stuff around edge computing and that sort of thing, so uh, there's certainly use cases in that area. Uh, but we've actually also seen uh, a large kind of a fair number of use cases in kind of the industrial markets. So, you know, energy and uh, control system, power plants and stuff like that that want to leverage uh, cloud technology are, are really having the same requirements as, uh, as, as what kind of telco kind of required for at the edge, you know, small devices. Uh, but still having a uh, kind of cloud capabilities. We're also seeing in the healthcare area, uh, you know, there's you know uh, complicated machines like MRIs that require uh, that that want to leverage cloud technology. And so again, it's a very similar <coughs> edge type uh, requirements for uh, for that as well. All right, I'll hand it off to Brent to kind of go through some of the more details. Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, so Starling X is a complete um, uh, edge, cl uh, edge cloud uh, software, software stack. So, uh, so we pa uh, package all this up, starting with, the, uh, starting with the OS, which is based on uh, CentOS. Then we leverage uh, various, um, various OpenStack, uh, various uh, third-party components, such as LibWork, QMU, OVS, uh, DBDK, and of, course, uh, and, of course, the various OpenStack uh, services. Um, on top of that, uh, there's, a, there's a number of Starling X uh, specific services that, have, uh, that are part of the, uh, the part of the stack. So first off, we've got uh, configuration management that provides uh, host installation, inventory discovery, and host configuration, as well as a sy uh, system level configuration and configuration of the various platform, uh, platform services. Host management, uh, that service manages the, uh, the life cycle of the host, uh, provides host fault monitoring, alarming, and uh, recovery from, uh, from faults. Uh, service management is a high availability cluster management for, uh, for the platform, uh, for the OpenStack services, as, as well as the other uh, platform services. Uh, software management, uh, this the subsystem encompasses uh, uh, software patching framework for uh, for the management and deployment of patches, as well as a uh, as an upgrade uh, hitless upgrade framework as well for for the system. Uh, infrastructure orchestration. Um, so this this subsystem provides the high availability management of uh, of uh, virtual machines, as long as, along with a um, uh, an auto uh, an automated uh, deployment mechanism for patches and, and upgrades that I touched on above. And lastly, uh, fault management. Uh, so uh, capability for alarm and log reporting uh, for all the various uh, uh, Starling X services. Uh, so the Starling X uh, solution is, is scalable. You can start as low as uh, one server, which would combine the control, compute, and, and storage functions, and this can run on, uh, and this can uh, run on uh, lower end hardware, such as a, a Xeon D. Then we got the uh, two node version of that, which is a highly available uh, configuration. 
moving up to a, a frame level system with uh, with the separate uh, control storage and uh, compute. Uh, we do support a uh, we do support an integrated uh, Ceph cluster as part of the uh, the frame level solution, and uh, and then at the top we've got the uh, large scale data center solution or distributed edge computing solution, which would be com uh, which would be a multi region model. So just going to uh, go into a little bit more detail on uh, some of the um, the Starling X services. So configuration management, it, uh, it manages the installation, which would uh, auto discovery of, of new nodes, installate, managing the installation parameters, bulk provisioning of, uh, of nodes through a configuration file, uh, the nodal configuration, um, stuff like the, uh, the role that the node is going to assume, such as is it a controller, is it a compute, is it a storage, um, the, the attributes of that node, um, the core assignments, the memory uh, assignments, including huge pages, uh, the network interfaces, and, and various storage assignments. Uh, it, it also does all the, the inventory uh, discovery, so uh, number of CPUs, the amount of memory, um, ports and GPUs, and so on. Uh, host management, so this subsystem manages the uh, full life cycle of the, the host. It uh, detects and automatically handles host failures and initiates the recovery. It, uh, it does monitoring and alarms for cluster connectivity, resource utilization, hardware faults. Uh, it interfaces with uh, board management for out-of-band control as well. And this is all available via REST API. Uh, software management. Um, so, th with the Starling X services, we're able to uh, deploy so software updates for to, for to fix bugs, uh, security fixes, and even to uh, deliver uh, deliver new functionality. It's an integrated end-to-end -end rolling uh, rolling upgrade solution. Um, We, um, we support uh, multiple uh, types of uh, patching in service and uh, out of service patching. For patches that, are, uh, that do require a node to be taken down, I need to replace my kernel for instance. Uh, the orchestration framework would automatically uh, migrate the VM workloads off of that node and, uh, and, and, and basically uh, do a rolling update through the, through the cluster. And for, for upgrades and managed upgrades of all software, including it's a, a full stack upgrade versus just an open stack upgrade. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about is something is um, a major initiative that we're working on for our next release <coughs> is, uh, is uh, moving, uh, moving our infrastructure to uh, a, container, a containerized implementation. So, in, in this implementation, uh, Starling X will now uh, be running a, a bare metal Kubernetes cluster uh, with uh, supporting a Docker runtime, a Calico CNI plugin, Ceph, leveraging Ceph as the persistent storage backend, uh, authentication authorization of the Kubernetes API, uh, leveraging Keystone, uh, hosting a local Docker image registry, again with authentication from Keystone, and, uh, and pulling in uh, Helm as the package manager and the Airship Armada for the orchestration of uh, uh, and management of uh, uh, multi Helm chart applications. So once we got that in place, then we're going to containerize the, the infrastructure in, in uh, including an OpenStack. And the, the deployment and lifecycle management of that will leverage uh, OpenStack Helm. And as I mentioned below, we're also leveraging Armada as well. So once this is in place, we've got a platform um, that can support containerization of the infrastructure as well as application workloads. So we can support both containers and VMs. Um, another thing I just wanted to highlight for next release is um, a CI, uh, CIDC and enhancements. So Starling X is a full source distribution. It, uh, 
It currently requires the end user to uh, take, take the source code, uh, the build tools that we, we provide, and build a full ISO for deployment. Um, we're, we're partnering with a, uh, with a, a Canadian nonprofit uh, foundation called Sengen. Um, and to provide a public repository for, for build artifacts as well as uh, pre-built ISOs. So this will, this will aid in onboarding uh, new users to the community. On top of that, for our next release, uh, we've got uh, over 40, 40 initiatives. Uh, the list is currently being prioritized and we're, we're certainly, certainly looking for uh, uh, people to join us in the community to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, drive these forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bruce. Thank you, Brad. I'm going to talk a little bit about the community, and uh, we are an OpenStack pilot project. Uh, we firmly believe and role model the four opens. I think we've all heard about that earlier today. Um, we have a technical steering committee that is responsible for overall architecture direction. Um, Ian, Dean, Brent, uh, Miguel, all our members of Saul, all members of our technical steering committee. Uh, we're completely committed to diversity, openness, and um, encouraging new contributors. Um, it's a very large project, and one of the things we've done, a couple of the things we've done are a little bit different than OpenStack. Um, we've actually split the project up into a set of sub-projects so each of the services that Brent was just describing is its own project within the community. And we also have a number of horizontal services like documentation and release and build and security. And we're following, for instance, we're following the standard OpenStack security practices. We have a dedicated security team dealing with security issues. We have a dedicated release team. We have a couple of other initiatives um, we're working to enable these services in DevStack right now. That should complete before the end of the year, and we probably won't need that project going on much further. We're also working on um, getting rid of our Python 2 code and converting that to Python 3. The other thing we've done that's a little different than uh, standard OpenStack projects is we've split the role of the PTL. So each of these sub-projects has a team lead and a project lead. And we've done that for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, I think, uh, Dean said earlier today, um, technical people are not always good at project management. Project management people aren't always good at, at uh, the technical part. We're blessed to have an abundance of both kinds of people in our community right now, and this gives us the chance to leverage those. Uh, we have core reviewers that have been um, selected by the Technical Steering Committee blessed by the team leads, determined by the project leads, and then we have contributors. Uh, contributors, very simple. A lot of this document, this governance came from uh, Kata containers, if you're familiar with their governance. It's a lot of the same words. If you've made a contribution to the project in the last 12 months, you're a contributor. That allows you to serve in a leadership role, and it allows you to be um, uh, run for the elected positions and to vote in those elections. If you're a core reviewer, you have the, not only the authority, but the responsibility to review the code changes coming in, um, making sure that those meet the standards of the project, that they're technically correct, and core reviewers can cause code to be merged. Talk briefly about the technical leads. Um, a technical lead in one of the projects is a core reviewer but they're also responsible for helping set the technical direction of the project underneath the guidance of the technical steering committee, while the project lead is out doing the coordination and communication and the tracking and all the typical project management kinds of roles. The TSC, most of which are in this room with you today, is responsible for the overall technical direction of the project. Um, this is a little dated. We actually have eight people on the TSC right now. Um, Brent, Ian, Dean, Saul, Miguel, Anna from Erickson. I can't pronounce his name. Shuquan from 99Cloud. Um, we'll be moving to a nine-person TSC in <coughs> April. Did I miss someone? Curtis. Curtis, yes, Curtis. Is he here? Okay. 
Um, we'll be moving to a, a, a nine-member TSC in April with our first election. We'll, we will elect uh, five positions, and then it'll be five and four and five and four every six months. Um, we welcome uh, the involvement of the community. We're actively looking for help uh, for users, contributors, in any way, shape, or form. All the standard ways of finding out about us are all out there. Um, we have our web page, we have IRC. Um, we're not always super watching the IRC. We tend to be an email based project. I mean, maybe Dean's watching IRC, but. Um, most of the activity seems to be happening on the mailing list. We have a number of calls. We have a weekly community call. We have a TSC call every week. Many of the sub-projects have weekly calls. Um, anyone's welcome to join in those. Um, if you want to contribute, our bugs are in Launchpad. Um, we are um, putting um, our new specs into a dedicated spec repository. You're welcome to look at those documents to contribute to the reviews that are going on there. And then we're using Storyboard with the mystical number 86 as our project group. <laughs> um, so we have uh, 20 some repositories in the OpenStack infrastructure right now. Could yeah, some, something like that. All right, so. Um, Foundation asked us to remind everyone that um, everyone is welcome to contribute to the project, whether you're a member of the foundation or not, but um, we certainly encourage you, if you're not always already a member, you probably wouldn't be here, um, but of course you can join, and if you're joining on behalf of an employer, please have them sign the contributor license agreement. And thank you very much for coming to our session today. We're happy to take any questions you have. So is there like a quick start guide or just, you know, easiest way to get a minimal configuration up and running on a laptop or something? Uh, yeah, um, on our wiki there would be, uh, there's a document, quick, um, basically a quick start guide. As well, uh, as of yesterday, there's also pre-built ISO images, so you don't need to build, a, you don't need to actually build it yourself. You can just, just download that and take it out for a spin. You can run it on a VM on a fairly beefy workstation, and you can run it on Intel NUX. Um, we have a number of people internally that have stacks yeah. of NUX on their desktops. I can run it on my laptop. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Cool. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it.